Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today is Tuesday. Uh, you're probably wondering why I am not at work right now. So I have been through this whole freaking mess the last two weeks with jury duty. Um, and today I had to go to jury duty and luckily, luckily my group got dismissed because it was a terrible, like big criminal case. I was super stressed about it. I'm a very emotional person and I was anticipating just having this terrible luck today and getting chosen for this terrible case to be the jury, but they filled the jury before my group even got called in. So I'm not at work today. I figured let's celebrate. You know what? Let's make a new video for forward therapy and you guys are so excited. Two videos this week. Can you believe it? Girl, I cannot believe it. Ooh. So today we are talking about cubital tunnel syndrome, which is kind of like carpal tunnel syndrome's sneaky little sister. So that's what we're talking about today. Get excited. So cubital tunnel is similar to carpal tunnel because it is a nerve compression or entrapment syndrome. Whereas carpal tunnel occurs in the wrist, in the hand, cubital tunnel actually occurs at the medial elbow. And fun fact, have you ever hit your funny bone? Yeah, it hurts really bad, huh? And then you know that sensation where you get numbness, tingling, those funky paresthesias, and while you're kind of, ow, 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 it's not funny hopping around like a crazy maniac. You know how your whole arm all the way up to your pinky starts to get numb and tingly? That's because when you hit your funny bone, what you're actually hitting is your ulnar nerve and it hurts super bad. Yeah. So cubital tunnel syndrome is a nerve compression syndrome where the nerve is either getting compressed, entrapped, or overstretched or potentially snapping over, we'll talk about it in a minute, but snapping over the medial epicondyle. And it's important to know the structural components that make up the cubital tunnel. I like to think of the cubital tunnel as a little house, a little cozy house, it has walls, it has a roof, it has a floor, okay? So that's how I think of the cubital tunnel. And the components of the cubital tunnel or the little house for the ulnar nerve in your elbow, we've got two walls, okay? We've got the medial epicondyle on one side and the olecranon on the elbow on one side. Those are your walls, okay? The floor of the cubital tunnel is formed by the MCL, so part of the MCL ligament at the medial part of the elbow that stabilizes the elbow, and the joint capsule of the elbow, okay? So that's your little floor, you got your little walls and your little floor, and then the roof, of the carpal tunnel is actually the FCU um, and the arcade of Osborne. So just some fascial structures, some tendinous structures, a lot of fascia tissue that forms that roof. And the little ulnar nerve just sneaks on through it, okay? So it's like a little house that the ulnar nerve lives in near the elbow. So I alluded to it before, but there are three main ways that cause cubital tunnel syndrome or that cubital tunnel syndrome can occur. That didn't make sense. It's fine. It's Tuesday. You know what I meant. So the first way that it can occur is with pressure. So I want you to think really hard about every time that you're sitting at a desk, at a dinner table, you're driving in your car, um, where are your elbows at? Girl, a lot of times we are resting our elbows down on the edge of the table as we're typing or on the dinner table or we sit kind of like this when we're tired or bored in school or at work or whatever you're doing. When I'm driving with this hand, I'm resting my elbow on the window, girl, so I can like, you know, look outside, feel the fresh air. Ouch, that's not good for your elbow, okay? So all of those pressure situations, especially on hard surfaces, um, you have to really watch out for that with cubital tunnel because it can poke into that ulnar nerve and it can make you develop cubital tunnel syndrome or ulnar neuropathy, okay? That's the first way. Number two is with overstretch of the nerve. So our ulnar nerve is gonna be stretched in the flexed position. So think about all the times of day and night where your elbow is hyperflexed. I call it the telephone position, right? So people who are answering phones all day, um, if you talk on the phone a lot, which I, 
don't because I hate talking on the phone. But, you know, if you work in a place where you have to be on the phone all day and you don't have a headset, you might be hyperflexing your elbow all day while you're talking. The most common and most difficult way to prevent overstretch, right, um, is when we're sleeping. So think about the way that you sleep. We tend to kind of ooh curl in. We have these terrible wrist postures, terrible elbow postures, because we don't sleep like this, okay? Like we want to curl up in the fetal position. Our elbows are flexed. So a lot of people with cubital tunnel actually have a really hard time at nighttime. They'll wake up throughout the night or in the morning and their hands are totally numb because the, the ulnar nerve is being stretched so badly, okay? So that's the second reason is overstretch. Pressure, overstretch. The third reason, um, common reason why ulnar nerve uh, symptoms and neuropathy can occur at the elbow and the cubital tunnel is an anatomical variation. So some of us are built this way. Okay, it's not something we can necessarily prevent. Um, it's not necessarily an injury that happened to us or a repetitive load. Um, but some people actually experience snapping or subluxation of the ulnar nerve. So that means the nerve is jumping over the medial epicondyle and it's just kind of snapping back and forth. For some people, I imagine that's probably painful. I don't think everybody is probably painful with it, but it usually is occurring with kind of elbow flexion and extension. So you can imagine throughout the course of a day how many times you're bending and straightening the elbow. If that ulnar nerve is snapping over every single time, it's going to end up causing um, thickening of the fascial tissues. It's going to cause inflammation and irritation, and that can cause ulnar nerve injury at the cubital tunnel as well. So what are some of the symptoms associated with, with cubital tunnel syndrome? People will usually present telling you, my hand is so numb, I feel this numbness, it's painful, I'm waking up at night. Um, typically, people will say that they are, they're able to tell that it's the pinky and sometimes the ring finger of the hand because that is where our ulnar nerve has sensory innervation, right? So this half of the hand, most people the pinky and half the ring finger, some people just the pinky, we're all a little bit different. So people will typically complain of numbness, tingling, paresthesias of the pinky and the ring finger, okay? A lot of people will also have motor impairments as well. So that includes, you know, weakened grip. So obviously with ulnar nerve impairment, we're going to lose or have weakness of the inner osseous muscles um, that are doing abduction, adduction, the uh, lumbrical muscles for the ring and the pinky finger, which are really are a very strong MP flexor or MCP joint flexor. Um, and so people will have this weakened grasp. They're not able to hold on to things. You're also going to see people with weakened pinch because our adductor pollicis, that little muscle here, is a really big stabilizer during pinching motions of the thumb. And so you're going to lose a really big chunk of your strength um, of your pinch from that as well. And of course, there's other motor symptoms, but those are just some basic ones to be on the lookout for with your patients or with yourself that might be experiencing cubital tunnel syndrome. What does hand therapy treatment usually look like for people with cubital tunnel syndrome? Um, every, month, every practice might be a little bit different. Every hand therapist might be a little bit different. I'm gonna tell you what I tend to focus on in my practice and with my patients. So a huge, huge component of any repetitive strain injury but especially nerve compression is going to be activity modification and avoiding those um, static postures or awkward positions um, or repetitive movements that may have caused or worsened the nerve symptoms. So a huge part of it is getting people to modify their activities to prevent this hyperflex position, to stop leaning on the edge of tables or hard surfaces on the elbow, um, and then sleeping. This is the worst part, but we splint people with their elbow in about 25 to 30 degrees of, of elbow flexion. So you're putting a splint right on top of the elbow here so that they can't flex their elbow, which is just the worst thing ever, but it really does help people tend to have reduction of symptoms really quick with that. Um, and of course, like any nerve syndrome, it's gonna take time for it to completely go away, but we're trying to manage the symptoms and make sure that they're starting to feel improvements over time. Um, I also do a lot of manual treatments and stretching, um, trying to get the nerve gliding and, and 
mobilizing better through the cubital tunnel. So I tend to find that people with cubital tunnel will have a lot of like flexor and pronator tightness. Um, they may even have kind of some triceps issues going on, some tricep tightness or things like that where they need to be in a good stretching program. They need to be um, mobilizing the tissues or kind of massaging the tissues, getting out any trigger points that they might have um, and try, just trying to offload the pressure or the um, tension on the nerve. And then we also wanna get the nerve gliding a little bit better through the tunnel. So I do a lot of nerve um, gliding programs, um, just teaching them a lot of different stretches they can do on their own, and it's all about empowering the patient to treat themselves better all the time, promoting healthy stretching routines, um, strengthening routines, and then a really big component for my practice um, and for my patients of that have repetitive strain injuries is gonna include a lot of postural retraining and proximal support. So I tend to notice that a lot of people, we get into this like very forward posture. A lot of people have the forward neck posture or we got that like tech neck where we're just texting all day or you know working on our laptops. We tend to get very tight in our pec major and minor muscles and so we kind of crunch this way our shoulders our humerus will internally rotate and we're getting less blood flow to the extremities in that posture right because all of our um, nerves and our circulation is getting kind of crunched in that position so we want to try and uh open it up girl okay a lot of stretching of the pec muscles right you can do your doorway or your corner stretching um, i tend to do a lot of postural or um, scapular strengthening with the rotator cuff so i'm having people do a lot of like rows external and internal rotation progressing to external and internal rotation as long as they're not causing numbness, tingling, and paresthesias for my patients. I love strengthening the scapula and postural muscles because not only are we gonna get better circulation and improve um, the position of the nerves and make sure that they're not getting pinched up here, we're also going to help facilitate future likely, uh, sorry, we're gonna facilitate improved performance in the future and so they're going to be less likely to get hurt because they already have good posture if we go to do a task and our body mechanics are not good our posture is poor we're holding things way far away to us we're likely going to get hurt and if you have good posture you set yourself up for the task right you're able to maintain that strength and posture you're going to have less repetitive or compensatory movements down the arm so I always focus a lot posturally, proximally, people don't understand it, but if you explain to them, hey, this is why we're doing these activities, I find that the buy-in is a lot higher. Um, and people like to exercise, you know? They like to feel like they're doing something for themselves. So if you can get the patient to buy into it, you're gonna have a lot better success with these patients. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information very quickly a very brief introduction to cubital tunnel syndrome a little quick overview that is where we're going to end today's video i hope you guys learned something or i hope this sparked a curiosity in you to do a little bit more research or look into cubital tunnel syndrome more hopefully you're not experiencing it yourself but if you are you might have a good idea of kind of where to start with some of your activity modifications, right? So avoiding pressure, avoiding hyperflexed positions. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any more hand therapy videos. Thank you guys so much for watching.